Uh, this is Young Ju. Um, 25 minutes from now, if you love this, you should call him immediately because he has a verbal offer from someplace. So this is your last chance, probably, to get uh, to get Young Ju. All right. So uh, here's a motivational slide. It's kind of superfluous here. Uh, this, this is what I'm going to talk about uh, today, really. These two problems, they're kind of dual problems. One is deployment, one is rendezvous. Uh, if you think about the spectrum of all the things that you might want your robots to do in formation, this is, uh, in my opinion, a couple of end points. And the first one I'll talk about uh, is the distributed consensus problem, which I think everybody here is probably also familiar with. Here's the slide, just so that you'll feel good if you see your name on it. And here's the, the, the real, if, if your, your name was there, right, if you didn't see it, it was there. Uh, this is the slide that really illustrates the problem that we want to solve. Um, there's the consensus rule, uh, I think everybody knows it. The red dots are robots that are broken, and what you see is plenty of robots converge and achieve rendezvous uh, as you would like them to, but then a bunch of robots get lost in the field of broken robots. So. Uh, the motivation for this today is Gorov. So when Gorov drops all of his robots at sea and wants to collect them all, uh, this algorithm that I will show you today will rendezvous all of the functioning robots to one place, uh, and then Gorov can decide whether he wants to recover the failed robots individually or not. And so that's kind of the motivation for the first part of the talk. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising that consensus doesn't work. It's an averaging algorithm. Everybody knows averaging is not a robust statistic. Uh, so that's not a surprise. Uh, it turns out that uh, you can do things like try to enforce connectivity constraints on the network. Uh, you might think that would help, it doesn't. It exacerbates the problem. This is probably the, I think one of the more famous ways to do uh, distributed consensus with uh, connectivity constraints. It's called the circumcenter algorithm. And basically you just make sure nobody ever moves too far away from his neighbors uh, as the algorithm goes. And you see here that what happens is if you try to enforce connectivity constraints, uh, the failed robots, you never move away from them because you try to maintain your connectivity. So that's even worse than uh, what you might otherwise have. Um, if you think about what might go wrong, uh, so this problem, uh, the reason I work on this problem, uh, I think it was seven years ago or so, I was watching an episode of Criminal Minds. Someone got kidnapped and taken into the forest. All the townspeople got together to search the forest uh, in a nice pattern where you make sure that you're like 10 meters from the person on your left or your right kidnapper was in the search party. Um, so they didn't find the child in the woods. And it made me think, well, all my friends who do distributed control assume that the kidnapper's not one of the robots, right? That there are no malicious agents. What happens if there are malicious agents? What's the worst thing that could happen? Uh, and we tried to characterize the worst thing that could happen, and that turned out to be difficult to do. Uh, so we now work on the easier problem of, can you make resilient algorithms that work even if some of the agents fail? Which turned out to be an easier problem in some ways. Um, the problems, when you look at them in this way, uh, they share some characteristics with what happens in distributed computing uh, under Byzantine failures. And there was a talk earlier this morning. Um, some of the work that you did is related to some of the work that we do, and you'll probably see that we stole some ideas uh, from you along the way. Your name is on that slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go back. Uh, there are two kinds of things that can go wrong. Uh, one of them, uh, you can have neighbors that are behaving badly and that affect you, and therefore you behave badly. Uh, if you've got teenage kids, you know what that, how that works in practice. Uh, and the other is connectivity can fail. Um, so I'm gonna talk about mainly the first part of those, right? So the connectivity constraints, I'm not gonna give you an algorithm today that enforces them properly. Uh, I will allude to some things that one can do, uh, and I'll even tell you some conditions that if they are satisfied, then you may conclude, but satisfying those conditions can be tough in practice. Um, back to consensus, uh, all the algorithms that are out there that I know basically work on some form of convex combination algorithm. So you look at your neighbors, you take some convex combination of their state, and that's how you adjust your own estimate of state. Uh, whether you're doing flocking, whether you're doing rendezvous, whether you're doing Bayesian estimation using a consensus algorithm, this is essentially how those algorithms work. Um, if you have constraints on connectivity, uh, it's the same kind of thing, you just add a new constraint variable or a new set of constraints that restricts the set of convex combinations that you can consider. But basically at the heart, convex combinations are the idea for these algorithms. Uh, and that leads to the idea, very quickly, uh, if I could just figure out which neighbor is the faulty neighbor, I could move into the, uh, the interior of the convex hole of my fault-free neighbors, that would be a good thing to do in terms of 
applying the right convex combination. But the trouble is, what if you don't know which neighbors are faulty? Uh, can you still make this happen? Can you still make this work? Uh, if you don't know which neighbors uh, the faulty one, you don't know which convex hole to construct. However, uh, if you could take your set of robots and divide them into two convex sets, uh, that have a non-empty intersection, moving into the interior of that intersection would be guaranteed to be in the convex hole the only fault-free nodes if you had only one faulty node. Right? So this is the idea at the heart of the algorithm that I'll talk about today. Uh, you can ask, is there a way to generalize that? And the, and the answer is yes. The idea is something called R visibility. Uh, here's the way it works. Uh, I've got a bunch of points. I can divide them into three groups. The convex holes of those three groups are shown, and there's the intersection, right? So when can I do that uh, is a question that computational geometers know the answer for. A guy called Turber uh, broke down this theorem that says when you can do it. Um, you can solve for the numbers r in terms of n instead of n in terms of r. Uh, and this is the idea. If you have enough points, you can take your set of robots and divide them up into r sets such that the intersections of the convex holes of those sets is not empty, and it's sure to be uh, inside uh, the interior of okay, all three of those convex combinations. So all you really need, uh, you've said enough, <laughs> just calm it down. <laughs> Uh, so you have a, a bunch of points, you divide them into, you partition them, yeah. such that the intersection of the convex holes of each element of the partition is not empty. So you care about how they relate to the convex hull of the initial set of points? No. Well, I mean, the, it will be inside the convex hull, right? Necessarily. So but it's not something one has to do uh, in a special way. So you blew through this. It's, it's not clear to me why this is. This is, a, uh, this is a useful condition. Oh, because here's the reason why. Uh, if you have uh, no more than n sub f faulty nodes, if you can partition uh, your, your set of points into n f plus 1 sets, uh, then at least one of those sets in the partition is only fault-free nodes. Because you have more sets in the partition than you have faulty nodes. So you have at least one set. And you don't know which one it is. Uh, in fact, all the faulty nodes may be in this one, and maybe all the others are fault-free. But you do know that at least one of those elements of the partition is completely fault-free. And therefore, if you could get into the interior of its convex hull, you would be in the interior of convex hull of fault-free nodes. Okay, so, uh, so that's what this is. Um, how, how, how do you guarantee that this convex hull is intersect? Oh, so that's a condition of the Tverberg theorem. Right, so that, that's given by the theorem of the computational geometer. If you have enough points, for sure, you can construct such a partition. And you pay, right? You, it's, a, it's a computationally intractable problem with rows. So the best algorithm grows exponentially with n. Uh, there are uh, approximations that one can do that I won't have time to talk about today that bring down the complexity at the cost of the size of the partition. Um, yeah, so there are trade-offs in practice. But in principle, this is how one can do it. Um, and that leads to uh, basically a pretty simple algorithm. Compute the Tverberg partition, find the, the intersection of all the convex holes, and move toward it. There's a bunch of stuff that's in the minutia and the details and the bookkeeping and the computational complexity that I'm not even going to talk about uh, unless you ask me questions at the end. And then I'll do like Callan and just wander around the audience and talk about complexity all day long. Um, here's how the algorithm works in practice, uh, just to show one illustration. Of simulation. Uh, the red dots are the bad guys, the blue dots are the good guys. They're trying to achieve consensus. consensus. Uh, Circumcenter algorithm uh, basically doesn't converge. Local averaging, the normal consensus algorithm. Uh, the robots converge in this case, but they're not to a stationary point, so they'll keep moving around. Uh, and in fact, as you saw in a talk earlier today, if you have a malicious leader, that malicious leader can lead you anywhere that he likes. Whereas the algorithm that I've been talking about with the Torberg points on the right, everybody converges to a stationary point. And here, a real-life example from the Robotarian. If 
you show a video of the Robotarian magazine, you do a shirt just like this. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? No, proof of existence. I think already existed. So yeah, so it's uh, and we were quite surprised and delighted by how easy it was to make this work. But uh, as Maggie said earlier, the fact that nobody's using it yet means you get one grad student to help your own grad student and make sure it works. Uh, this algorithm. We did send you a T-shirt, right? Didn't we? You didn't send me a T-shirt yet. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, the one on the on the right, you saw possibly after they converged, one of these robots went around and sort of tried to mingle with them and draw them off and. So even, uh, even in real robots, this algorithm works. Uh, and then uh, there's a theorem that says, here are the conditions. If they're satisfied, you converge. And I, I won't spend time discussing how to prove it, other than to say uh, it's a combination of ideas from these guys, uh, basically. And uh, that's all for the first part of the talk. Where, how much do I got? About eight minutes? Yeah. Cool. I'm going to ask a question while you set up the second part. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what we converge to? No, a fixed point, uh, but I can't tell you any. Well, I can tell you the fixed point will be in the convex hull of the, the, the fault free nodes. But they're not the 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 and, and that's all I got. Yeah, I don't have anything more than that about where they'll converge. And in fact, I suspect, and we haven't done this experiment, but I suspect uh, that because the, the Trober partition is not unique, I suspect if I sequence through them in a different order, I can converge to arbitrary points in the convex hull, but I don't know that that's true. Yes? And given that you know. You have f malicious guys, you know you have to always be in visible range of n neighbors all the time, right? Yeah, so there's a neighborhood size condition in the theorem. The, the, the big script n is the size of is the nodes in your neighborhood, right? So you, the condition is if your neighborhood is big enough uh, and you have the right connectivity conditions, then you converge in the right way. So that's f. If you have one bad guy, it's always five neighbors? You know, you know, I should know that, but I'm not good with math on small integers. Uh, so let's say yes. <laughs> um, there were, I think, 10 robots that had two failures, maybe 11 robots that we saw in the Robotarium example. I remember that it was uh, Hyongju asked, can we have one more robot so that we can have two faulty uh, nodes at some point? And the answer was yes. Because uh, Magnus got the unlimited faulty robots. Hey, uh, Chris, yes. so I'm trying to relate this to this uh, RS robustness concept and, and, yeah. and I, what you know about that works. I'm wondering how, what, what's the... I, so I don't know the analog between those two. And maybe after that dinner tonight we can talk about it. You can tell me. I don't know. Um, I have an answer. Uh, so, 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 <laughs> so if you take D equal to 1 in this setting, that's exactly... Oh, the yes. Yeah, so, so I should. The, the I, I, and the Trevor partition is for D bigger than one. A lot of the work in the distributed computing world and in the consensus world <laughs> is for scalar value <laughs> functions. Uh, and so D, the dimension equals to one, uh, these things are just to be the same. Uh, and in, in the case where D equals one and everybody lives on the real number line, you can do algorithms like discard the furthest away points on either side. But at the moment you move to, to a high dimensional space, you don't have an ordering on that space, and you can't discard the outliers in such a straightforward way. Here's another question. Does it break if I do the WMSR on X and WMSR on Y and then combine that? I mean, wouldn't that work? It's your talk. You should say it's no. like a workshop. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a workshop. You'll converge to the convex of the points. You'll convert, you'll convert to the convex hull of the element Y points. So, I um, so you'll no longer converge to the convex hull of the points. Yeah. You'll converge to the convex halls of the element Y points. And so if you're a robot and those two elements are coupled together as your configuration right. variable, then that doesn't work either. But that's not what you want. We're going to make sure, first of all, it didn't offend any of the people who do very closely related work. My, my talk's coming up. I'll trash you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, second part of the talk. Uh, deployment related literature, you're probably on that slide. Uh, distributed target detection is the problem that I'm going to talk about. Right? So I've got a bunch of sensors, and instead of gathering them together, I want them to deploy in an optimal way with respect to detecting targets uh, in the field. Uh, and the questions are those where do I place the sensors? How do I partition the environment? How do I assign sensors to the partition? And what's the right optimality criterion that I should use? Um, the traditional approach is you use something like Voigt's algorithm, right? Everybody deploys to the centroid of the, of the Voronoi tessellation in their Voronoi partition. Um, 
that, uh, if, if anybody fails as a sensor, then any target that is in the monoid tessellation uh, or tessel of that sensor won't be detected. Right? So the, uh, the idea of fault tolerance sensing is pretty straightforward. Uh, every piece of the target region should be covered by multiple sensors, and that's exactly what we're going to do. The question is how. How do you partition things and how do you assign sensors? Um, there's plenty of related research here as well, uh, and again, I don't have time to talk about it. Um, this is how I'm going to formulate the optimality criteria, and that's just to say I know something about the probability of missed detection for any individual sensor. Right? So that's what P of D sub I is, the probability that I detect, and then D bar is the probability that I fail to detect. And for every sensor I have such a thing, and I assume a conditional independence, uh, if I know where the target is, then the failure to detect it is independent among the sensors, right? They fail independently, and that's pretty reasonable. If I integrate that over the whole uh, space of possible locations of the target, I get the total probability of missed detection. Uh, there it is again on the top left. I can now express that if I partition the world up into regions and I assign sensors to each region, uh, and I know where the sensors are uh, within the regions, then I can express that uh, using this equation. And it's not particularly important what the exact formulation is. You can find variations of it in other kinds of papers. Uh, what's important is that you have this cost function expressed in terms of the three variables that you have uh, control over. How do you partition the environment? Uh, that's R. How do you put the sensors within the partitions? That's P. And how do you assign sensors to various regions in the plane? And that's the mapping called G. So it's just a big minimization problem. Uh, the first thing that you can show is uh, that the optimal partition is an order K Voronoi diagram if you want K redundancy, right? So if I want every region to be covered by three sensors, then it's an order three Voronoi diagram that makes the optimal partition. And it's probably not surprising. It's only surprising if, like me, you didn't know there were generalizations of Voronoi diagrams beyond order one, right? So uh, it's, if, if you already knew there were order five Voronoi diagrams, then this is exactly what you would expect the result to be, I think. Um, and there's the definition of it, if, if you don't know what it is. And there's an example of it. Um, where do you put the sensors within those partitions now that you know what the optimal partition is? What I'm going to do is rewrite the misdetection uh, probability in terms of the individual regions that are covered by individual sensors, right? So I'm going to, for any particular sensor, P sub I, I'll look at all the regions that he covers and then I'll compute the probability of failing to detect a sensor in those regions, in that region, uh, given that all the other ones we're looking at it are looking at it as well. And what's nice about that is if I add those together for all the sensors and divide by K, I recover my individual probability of this detection. So I've got a decentralized or distributed optimality criterion now that I can play with. And it's, it can be shown that the optimal uh, placement of the points is a critical point of the distributed cost function for each of the individual agents, right? So each agent now just looks at its neighborhood, computes a critical point, and moves toward it. Uh, there's the algorithm that achieves it. Um, there's a convergence proof based on LaSalle's principle. And here's a video, which is the best part. Um, and what you see on the left is Lloyd's algorithm converging to the Bornoi tessellation that you would expect. Uh, the red robots have failed sensors, and therefore the shaded regions are regions where you can effectively hide if you're a target and avoid detection. Uh, what you see on the right is our algorithm uh, that I won't go into the details of why they're switching and not all moving at the same time, but you'll notice that the, uh, the uncovered region gets smaller and smaller and eventually vanishes so that every, uh, every part of the space is covered by enough sensors that even if all the red ones fail, no target can escape detection or probabilistically with the probability of one we can detect a target. Um, after only 30 iterations, you get down to a very small probability just detection. Um, Wait, there are some cells that were not covered? I'm sorry, what? Were there cells that were not covered? The not in the end, but I let, I let the video run longer than 30 iterations. So um, there are conclusions that says what we're going to try and do more realistic stuff. If this talk had uh, more time associated to it, you would all have time to pick apart the rationale, the underlying assumptions, and the models. Unfortunately, we're out of time, uh, so I'll just stop there.